Hello, everybody, and welcome to Planet Sky FF, the world where nothing revolved around £50,000. My name is Serge. And my name is James. And as it seems to be the way at the end of the season, we have a guest again, James. We do, yeah. It was a promise we made last September that we would invite our Planet FPL podcast mini league winner onto the podcast. Sorry, Ben Cameron, you had a great season, but you didn't make it. I'm delighted that we are joined today by our friend Tala Nadeem. How are you, mate? Hello, James. Hello, Suj. I'm very well. Thank Good. you for inviting me on the pod. No Good problem. Man. You earned it, mate. You earned it by uh, by doing so well. I remember at the start of the season and when we were kind of planning, and James has always said a first-time player uh, could actually win this game. And you, it was your first season in Sky. You finished 11th overall. Um, and I think we're both really interested to find out why you got into the game and, and all that kind of stuff. But most importantly, did you did you know what you were going to spend the 50 grand on? <laughs> I, I, I guess I, I don't want to go into regret modes now. Uh, maybe I was too close and then dropped off towards the end. But overall, I really enjoyed the journey. And I'm very satisfied with how it went overall. I should point out, so Dan Cox told me that someone has won it first time round before. I can't remember the, the chap's name, but it was someone who won it about four or five years ago. Okay. Had won it at their, their very first attempt. Tala, how did you get into the game? What made you start playing Sky? So it was during a uh, previous year after lockdown, uh, when we were doing those Champman streams. It's there was uh, me. a bit of chat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so there was a bit of, uh, during the chat, there was a bit of conversations regarding Sky FF, how people were delighted with their daily points, etc. And then I got myself into it. Like, you know, in FPL, once the deadline is gone, you are done for the week. And especially in this COVID, there was long weeks of seven days. So if your captain is off on the first or second day, you are mentally thinking, oh my God, I have to regret now five, six days. So then I, it was that I thought you know, this game, purely from an enjoyment sense, would be good. You have multiple opportunities to make yourself happy, which was the prime purpose of getting into it. And then I, when I asked a couple of people around, I got to know that this is... This also gives an edge to people who are more uh, keen on fixtures knowledge, which is uh, one of my, uh, as in favorites or ambitions to get to know about fixtures and how they happen. So that was kind of the key for me to getting into it this season. So would you describe yourself, because we got to know each other a little bit through the, the chant man streams that I did last summer, because you helped provide quite a bit of the data for the live streams that I was doing. So do you, in terms of FPL management, do you focus very much on strategy? Are you someone that thinks uh, in terms of planning, like oh, I know when I want to use my bench boost. Have you got that kind of set out in your mind before a season even starts? Not, not before the season even starts in terms of chips, no. But in terms of transfers, uh, in general, I do like to plan about at least eight to 10 weeks in general for FPL. That uh, gives me an overall platform as to how my overall progress should be going. And I think that element was more crucial in Sky because as we'll go into further end, the players will know there are no chips elements. There is only overhauls and you have limited number of transfers. You cannot just do away with, just let take more hits and I'll be cleared off my backlog. So definitely that extra bit of planning comes into play in this. So I guess that does to an extent uh, give gave me an edge in sky planning. Eight to 10 weeks. I'm thinking eight to 10 days is a struggle for me. Forget eight to 10 weeks worth of planning and looking into the future. Um, that's fascinating. And then uh, do, do you get to watch, I mean, do you support, who do you support or kind of do you get to watch a lot of the games as well and layer in? Um, the eye test with your research and stats and planning and data. Yes, so I support Manchester United uh, and I do like uh, to watch a lot of games. In fact, this season I was really happy. Uh, I guess it might not be a popular opinion in terms of for people, the slow dripping of points. 
but from a game watching perspective i was really happy that we could watch all 10 games or at least had the opportunity to watch all 10 games be i watched them or not but having each and every game at a separate time really uh, was helpful for me and i do prefer the i test more compared to xg or those kind of stats i i'm not into those but i do prefer watching games and uh, reading uh, commentaries or uh, match reports along those lines that's that's interesting a couple of things i want to pick up on one you obviously said there's more days to make yourself happy let me tell you there's more days to make yourself unhappy there's <laughs> a key point to say there's you know there's plenty of days you, you know saturday sunday monday can all go wrong but the fact that you enjoyed the trip the drip feeding of the football this year i i find this quite a rare occurrence when we speak to people most people are like yeah. oh, it's too much and even for me i think because of the, the extended content that we've done this year i felt it necessary to watch all the games and quite often i felt like it was work I wasn't watching football i felt like i was i was working but the fact that you enjoyed it i think leads into something that's really important in sky stamina you need stamina to be good at this game to suffer the the bad days and to know that yeah shit saturday was bad but i can make sunday right did you when you started the season for the first time did you have a, a clear idea of what you wanted to do in terms of a team structure or have you just finished 11th by learning on the job in the first season i would say it was a mix of both uh, i had so the overall the first overall is too short no? i think only four four games four game weeks it yeah. was this season that's how so, it nearly so yeah. normally is okay so yeah so the strategy for those four was uh, in general because my first instance was uh, that 40 seems too less on transfers so my first uh, thinking was that one maximum two and then so set the team as in then uh, and then uh, it was that i will rehab a rethink during the international break for the post overall team so i had no thinking at all of the post overall team at that point so i took it step by step obviously during the international break then i went uh, further in terms of thinking how the long term cycle should be and i would say that those four weeks in terms of how my players were etc i learned quite quickly in terms of which players i picked maybe from an fpl point of view uh were not necessarily sky picks and that is i guess uh, one key point for people to learn who are going into this scheme further that all not all players who are good in terms of fpl are necessarily good in terms of sky and could be vice versa yeah absolutely did you where did you where did you peak in terms of rank uh the patricio uh, hall against fulham on on the friday uh, i became third after the rankings update on that friday night and very unfortunately uh, the next day sunday was the first day of this season i think the 10th or 11th of april when i missed my first deadline oh no unfortunately and yeah Uh, so we you and me are the same I, I, you and me are just the same you out with you <laughs> but yeah in in terms of rank that was the peak on in terms of points closest to the first i was four points off but at that week i was ranked fifth a couple of uh, weeks before that that was very tight uh, and i obviously was closely following michael shipley's progress and ben cameron's progress because initially this league was the only league where i was second so at the back of my mind i always no hard feelings against ben but i always wanted to surpass him <laughs> <laughs> i'd have to send ben a get well soon card or something <laughs> <laughs> oh it's fascinating I, i i was really blown away i mean we 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 looked at some of the stats and data and uh ff stuff obviously frank did you can look at your season's review and what have you um and james obviously james you beat me by 300 let's have a look here sorry for 380 odd points mentally you beat me by nearly 400 uh and 30 points but it was the number of points from your captain that that destroyed me right of of the 430 points 
I think 380 of them are because of captaincy. So literally, you, your captaincy, and again, um, you, you beat James, but the gap between your captaincy points was bigger than your overall gap in points, which just, just goes to show that you killed it with your captaincy from what I can see. Yeah, I guess uh, it's it's a bit of a mix in terms of luck and uh, strategy. I, I did favor Kane quite a lot uh, in Sky, but uh, not necessarily in FPL. For some reason, I was trying to hedge my bets at the start of the season that I would pick one player in Sky and not in FPL, which uh, unfortunately plummeted my FPL rank, but at the same time kept it's the least blossoming me in Sky. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and, and yes, there was a couple of elements which I would again say, maybe hedging or uh, seeking the ceilings, like Cancelo, uh, his haul against West Brom, uh, when I captained him for that 50-pointer, I captained Son, in game week two, I believe, where he scored four goals against Southampton. Wow. Uh, for his 56-pointer. So, so so those kind of hauls, I guess, uh, I had them. Uh, Bruno, I had almost from the very start in Sky, but I think probably until game week 13 or 14, I never had him in FPL. So, hey, Bruno was your most popular captain 22, 22 times you captained him. You're quite right, that Sun Hall, 56 points against Southampton in game week two. Um, you must have started with Sun as well, because the only transfer you made before overhaul was a, yes. the, the popular one where people bought Kevin De Bruyne. So you must have had him from the start. Wow, you watched Tottenham against Everton and they're still captain Sun against Southampton. I can't believe that. That's incredible. But it's interesting what Suj says about the captaincy. So to just emphasise that, your captaincy points were four short of 2,100, uh, 1,996. Mine was 1,864. You beat me on captaincy points by 132. And I don't feel like I did that bad on captaincy last year. I know that there's that we've seen this. There's some that hit captain more often than, than yourself even. But that, that, absolutely accounts for the difference between us. You finished on 3,576 overall. I finished on 3,523. So there was, what, 53 points between us overall, but you got about 130 more captain captaincy points than me. So, I know where I didn't win this game now. Well, uh, everyone always asks us, James, but what changes would you make to the game? Remove captaincy, you might stand a chance of beating Talibut. <laughs> <laughs> Get rid of captaincy, James. You've got a chance now. <laughs> Did, did you yeah. always go with the most popular player, generally speaking, then, Salah? No, that's why on uh, review of my stats, I am kind of surprised that I had Bruno the most captain because I guess less than 10% in my mind, I had the feeling that this would be the most popular captain of the day I should go. But uh, still, how the games, uh, the fixtures laid out, it was kind of automatically that Bruno was in most days separate to Kane or Salah in the match day. And ultimately, it led me to go to Bruno, being of the players I had on that day, looked like the uh, one who would return most points. So probably less than 10%, if I'm being very honest. Obviously, I don't have proofs for that. But I've been very honest, I totally ignored ownership in terms of captaincy. Okay, interesting. I was just looking. Fernandez got eight more points for Tala than me. And if you remember, Serj, I, I had that day when uh, I didn't check and it was on Bamford instead of Fernandez. Yeah. So you could yeah. almost yeah. say that was near that, enough level. But on Harry handy. Kane, uh, Tala picked up 55 more points off Kane than me. So uh, you I, had I, I, 296, I, Tala 351. I wonder if there's a Kane problem for me there where I'll... It's psychological because of my bias to Tottenham that when I have moments of doubts, I just go with the other player. I think that happens to me sometimes. Yeah. So I think it's, it's, a, probably it's not more... a Kane problem, it's a Tottenham problem. Well, because you have 100% faith in Kane. I do. I know it. And, and so you should. It's just the rest of the guys running around with him. But obviously, not enough because that's mm. Tallis beat me by what, 53 points? He's got 55 more points out of Kane than me. Yeah. That's the exact difference in terms of our season. There's obviously stuck the armband on Harry Kane a little bit more. Did you start with him prior to 
at the start of the season? Did you have Kane and Son at the start? Um, no. So I only had, uh, from Tottenham, I only had Son. But immediately post overall, uh, probably you will remember uh, from your one of your podcasts, uh, post overall about the double up of Kane and Son and how that Tottenham uh, patch at that time could be a differential. And I think you also went to with that. I did. I had Kane and I Son, definitely yeah. went with that. Yep, and I definitely went with that idea, which I believe kind of we went into the Tottenham purple patch and after maybe game week 12 or so when they started to fall off at that time, the fixtures also turned and I let go, I think, of Son. So kind of I, I steamed it to Tottenham at the right time, if I would say. So did you kick Kane all the way through? Yes. Yeah, that would be the difference because I sold him. That'll be what the difference. So I need to work out what them points were for me in the middle, I think, Serge, to have the answer, which I'm not going to do during a live podcast. No, but I can point you in the direction of a few other kind of interesting things from uh, that I picked up from, from your data, Teller. In terms of defenders, so I did particularly badly overall anyway, but I only picked up 900 points from defenders. James picked up 1,046. You picked up 1,255. So there's a, there's 210 points there, James, that that the Tala had on you from defenders. Now I understand, obviously, your formation can have a big impact on it. So looking at that, I mean, five three two. You played five three two, 41 percent of the time. Like I was blown away with how often you had five at the back, um, and it's completely like for James, it was barely 12 percent, and for me, it was 10 percent. So you you really were happy to gamble on big at the back yes uh, although from the start i did have this uh, thinking at the back of my mind i i recall the hub podcast used to quite emphasize on this that five at the back is not so flexible compared to other formations mm. but i got uh, caught because that's what i was thinking I, I got stuck a couple of times where I, I couldn't maneuver out of five at the back because of the players that i had yeah but what I did was I uh, kept the budget uh, as such that if I wanted to move to any midfielder or attacker, I could. And it would have been a budget midfielder or attacker because I already had Fernandez, Salah and Kane, the top uh, three. And De Bruyne was most of the time out of my plans or he was injured. So I did have the budget to move to any other budget uh, midfielder or forward if I needed to. And why I was keen on defenders is kind of, you could say, uh, bias in terms of they were delivering for me. So I had Westergaard uh, when the Southampton Newcastle single game day was happening, uh, where most people went to Ings or uh, Adams. Uh, I went to Westergaard seeing how Saints were performing at the time and his passing and his attack from threat from corners. Then uh, overall, I favored Man City defense quite a lot. Cancelo, Stones, uh, Diaz, and also Liverpool. Uh, I had uh, Liverpool defense. I had Robo. Arsenal defense. I favored holding uh, for their single game days when people went for Lacazette. I guess overall, uh, my favor of defenders was purely from a consistency perspective. The the returns of four to five points are more likely if you take a four to five game uh, period compared to a midfielder scoring one in three or four games. And that is why I felt I had to favor defenders, those defenders which are good in passing tiers. Mm. I mean, Robo Robertson did really well for you. Uh, 50 points more for you than he did for James and 40 points more than for me. We just held him in the wrong game, James. <laughs> we kept him in FPL. We just didn't keep him in sky. Uh, Liverpool um, double up in Sky for a long oh, period, didn't I? I mean, that period I had Matip, I had Robertson for quite a long time during mm -hmm. that as well. Yeah. It's funny that you talk about the five, four, five points per game because if you look at your, your top scoring players, the defenders as an average generally score less. I suppose it's, it's biased by the fact that you don't captain them as much because they're yeah. seven and eight points per game, whereas your know, Fernandez, Canes can be 12, 14. But if, if you're captaining those guys the majority of the time they're playing and that drops to half, then there's not that much in it between uh, Kane, Salah, Fernandez, and Stones, Diaz, Robertson, and so on. Um, that they, they can really still deliver the defenders. 
uh, one of the dangers with five three two, um, if you have a back five and you've got say Dallas and Vestergaard, for example, in a back five, which would have been quite reasonable. I'm sure a lot of people had that at certain points this season. The danger with that, where like I think you're saying you got stuck, surges, you can't go to a midfielder. And even if you did, what midfielder are you going to get at 6.4? I mean, like Rafinha kind of developed during the season as a very good option. But you need to leave the money, basically, to be mm. able to get to a forward or you have to buy another shit defender. It's your only way out of it. So the, the, the trick, really, is to try and leave some money so that you can at least jump from Dallas Vestergaard back to the kind of price that Bamford was this year. Mm. And I think that's what, Tally, you're saying you did, right? You always had the money there even a little bit that just gets you somewhere. Yep, I guess that was the key. If I needed to move the enabler like Westergaard or Dallas, so I kept enough money to move to, let's say, Bamford, Watkins, or even DCL, uh, that that kind of range. Mm. That's interesting. Did you, Tala, did you save transfers too long, do you think, on reflection? Definitely. That that was one overall regret of mine, given uh, where... So regret in the sense, the position where I was in. And realistically speaking, although I did not want to get overwhelmed, but realistically speaking, I was in touching distance of number one, even towards the very end. And I can uh, reveal now that I had six transfers when Southampton versus Palace game was king, king off. So it was just two weeks left for the season. And I had six transfers even then. And the average, I believe, of the top 10 was two. So I always had it in the back of my mind. There are a lot of people on one or two and probably some zero. And I have six. But eventually I realized that I had too few days to make use of those transfers eventually. Especially when the Manchester United and uh, Liverpool game got, got called off. So everyone had uh, a Manchester United player or a Leicester player or a Liverpool player on the Tuesday or the Thursday. And my edge of steam, uh, going getting a Saints player on the Tuesday or a Villa Everton player on the Thursday got away because I would have had a captaincy when majority wouldn't have had. But that went away and then hence my best use of holding back transfers also went away. Yeah, going into, I was just looking from uh, game day 100. I think there were 133, I want to say, in the season. From game day 100, you had 13 transfers left. I had six. And you still ended up with, obviously, the sixth left from that Tuesday night where Southampton played Crystal Palace. is really interesting. It also is a shame for you that many of them transfers at the end didn't work out for you, like buying St. Maximin on Friday when they played Man City, you told Ian Acho. Antonio, you bought in, who did get your return, but you told Rob Holding, who did okay in the last couple of games. And you bought Jota in for Lingard, and I think you found out later that day that Jota was injured. Am I right in saying that? Definitely. So, on making that uh, St. Maximin transfer on Friday, that was the thinking. It was either St. Maximin or Joe Willock. And it was, if I went St. Maxim and then I had to go Jota. And if I went Villock, then I had the option of Mane. And wow. kind of, if we think back that because I went St. Maxim, no, I didn't go Villock, I couldn't go Mane. And then on the last day, I couldn't, oh, actually on the Wednesday, I couldn't go Bruno to Pepe because I had to reverse my Jota error. And if you see in a shell, Villock got so many points, Mane got so many points, and Bruno didn't play. Everyone knew he wouldn't play on Sunday. So I missed on Pepe's Wednesday and Sunday halls. Tala, can I, so, give, you some, can I can give you some advice? Is... Don't, don't work out how many points you would have got from that, mate. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> don't do it to yourself, mate. Oh, because man. you would have been very close to winning the game, mate. Just on those moves at the end. Yeah. I, I would say ultimately... I might be thinking this way, but it does, luck has an effect because throughout the season, I probably was lucky in a sense. I had very few injuries in my squad. Probably KDB was one, Barnes another, and maybe only Westergaard, yeah. So only maybe three or four. And where I guess I have read other people having more than 10 or so. Mm -hmm. And I did have this question also, one of the questions at the start, that how do we cater in the, the 40 transfers? How much do we leave for injuries only? 
how much do we leave for fixtures and how much and ultimately i didn't have to leave quite a lot for injuries which probably did bite me at the end uh, one or two of the injuries but in general i would say there is a luck element you could not predict injuries and if you are lucky with it then it's good just don't buy joe matip and you'll be all right and james <laughs> no, Joe Definitely, I avoided him. So I'm picking on you, by <laughs> oh, Bring Lewis Dunk back into the conversation. Uh, yeah. So that kind of counters the argument a little bit, though, Talix. You felt like you left too many, but actually, had you made one change different, which would have set off a, a chain of events that might have seen you get an extra 50 points or even maybe even more over those last sort of six or seven game days, then we're having a different conversation then. So it's almost it's just like ultimately the gamble at the end didn't quite work out one of my learnings from season one was I held too much back too long so I got to like November last year bearing in mind the season started in August I don't lose like three transfers I think I had too many left so I finished really well but I was too far behind but ironically you were obviously in a really strong position of third at one stage and with the power of having more transfers than most people as well I'd have fucking shit myself at that stage should <laughs> been the end of the podcast I think I'm going dark <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it is difficult I think as much as it is uh, easy to it's ifs and buts might be maybe right? if this happened then that might have happened but so this dunk for us <laughs> <laughs> yeah so it, it, it's unhelpful but the conversation we're having though Tala makes me feel like you have the makings of a consistently good Sky player like your brain thinks in the right way for this game I, I think, yes, I would be confident. Although one thing I was only thinking yesterday was about fixtures and a little cutting edge, which I might have had this season. I might not have had, I will, I might not have in next season or so will be the fixture announcements. In this season, you will obviously everyone noted that how late the fixtures were announced. But because I was so uh, dived into predicting fixtures, etc., I had all plans in place as to f- if the fixture came out this way, I would have this transfer. If the fixture came out this way, I will have this transfer. But in a normal season, we get the fixtures announced more than a month in advance. So then that sort of cutting edge will probably not be with me in next season or so. Hence, I felt probably this season I had. Although being it the first season, I had more chance than I might have in any future season. I said that to you last week. I said that to you last week about me as well, didn't I? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Same same thing. thing. I almost feel like I had an advantage this year. A little bit like, I mean, it sounds like Tyler went further on than I did, but I could see the the problems and the avenues and what might arise. Obviously, next year, if we do get full capacities back in, which guess we'll know during the European Championships if that's a possibility or not for the start of next season. If we get back to that stage, and particularly obviously if away fans have to travel or are allowed to travel, then the Premier League is committed to having to let these clubs know at six weeks' notice, bar the last one or two game weeks. You have to give them six weeks' notice to if they're going to move a game to a Sunday or Monday or something. So in terms of the planning, as Tyler said, it's going to be much easier for the majority of people and it will be easier for us as well. But I think we had an advantage on this year gone. The little things, like I said, where, okay, like last week, Gator, that Friday and Monday he had with the, the uh, Burnley and Newcastle games. All right, okay, it didn't work out great, but I also didn't waste two transfers getting him because I had him in from the overhaul. could see that one of those two games was highly likely to be a single game day, and that was going to whichever one it was going to be was going to solve the problem. It ended up being both of them. So those little things, you say, okay, it didn't work, but it definitely saved me at least one transfer. Yep. Those things next year, people are going to be able to see it five, six weeks in advance. It's, oh, okay, fine. Yeah. And then you can make the decision then, can't you? Rather than that kind of last minute panic. That's it as well. I, Cause I think the shorter notice causes more panic. The more panic, the more wrong decisions people make. So suddenly you land in, you go, I've got no interest in palace. Oh my God, they've got two single game days. Right, let's buy Wilfred Zahar. Loads of people bought Wilfred Zahar. Wilfred Zahar didn't play in either game because of because they he got COVID and we didn't even know till yep. the game started because I think there was a game on before Burnley and Palace that night Correct. as well. So Correct. there were a few people that bought Wilfred Zahar. I mean, you bought PVA. I presume that's why you bought PVA was for those two games, Tyler. 
yes i bought pva for that 2 for 0 apparently over a man city player but uh, obviously didn't work out on points but i would add that in general uh, I, i didn't do any rage or uh, last moment transfers uh, i did always go with my planned transfer which i which i am in that way satisfied that in the heat of the moment i didn't do x y z i always had this in mind that although i did make transfers on the game day and after seeing the lineups but i had it in my mind these two three which i have i will only go by this i basically blocked out the noise if i would say from my mind which was i guess key 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 to progressing well what would you tell him what would you advise for a new player next season now i would say it's uh simply uh the best thing would be uh to take it uh, not fully mix it with fpl the forwards etc in terms of points scoring you can but uh, i would say uh, keep yourself flexible which is the best i believe uh, strategy in this game keep yourself flexible in terms of formation uh, by either having a flexible formation or having the budget to be have a flexible formation and uh, in terms of your plans always have 2 2 3 because uh, you have the added advantage of lineups this in this game which you obviously don't have in fpl and when lineups come up you that window is too short to then start thinking and then if you start thinking then then you can get noise no you are asking people you don't have your own plans so i would say always try to have two and if not two then three uh, targets in mind once you have the lineups and then act there is one counter argument to the potentially having longer to plan next season is uh, i think what happens then is if you look at say six weeks worth of fixtures quite often p- people will make their plan and you might be seven eight nine transfers in during that period depending on when it is in the season one thing goes wrong and that whole plan is changing and that's something else that leads to a lot of frustration so you could have a plan for six weeks and then virgil van dijk gets done by Jordan Pickford on the Saturday morning which was was the first game after overhaul wasn't it we all had to sell him mm-hmm. but something like that could happen during the mid season and your whole plan has to change so i think one of the things i've really learned is absolutely that you've got to have multiple solutions to problems and for me it's almost going into a weekend this is a little bit dark but almost going in and going if that player gets injured today or sent off what am i doing tomorrow I'm almost at that that mindset of it before the problem happens. That's that gets more difficult once you start looking at longer term plans because you're going to deal with frustrations. Oh, I've got six. I've got a six week plan. It's lasted one day. It's in the bin. Start again. Mm. People make mistakes then. Yeah, I mean, it comes back down to the, the joy in the game. I think like, like one of the things that comes across in your just the way you speak about it is you enjoy it, Tala. But you you enjoy it and. Uh, you talked about it bringing you happiness I, i i don't feel like you're the type of guy that gets too down if things go wrong um but tell me if i'm wrong but but if you enjoy the game and things like that happen james it's fine because that's part of playing tell has been in the pub non stop since he bought the ago jota a couple of weeks ago <laughs> <laughs> he has to stop so's the ago jota <laughs> possibly yeah i i think uh in previous seasons i might have but covid uh, has teached me a good lesson in terms of uh, being happy uh, and satisfied with the blessings you have mm. uh, in, in this period and then i have had a very different approach to fpl this season also in terms of not being too bothered with how a particular game week's rank was or as i was saying i don't feel i am so invested how my fpl player is doing in a game because as i was saying earlier no i really like to watch games but i i don't have in that game i have a feeling oh if uh, watkins missed the penalty uh, watkins missed a golden chance then oh he could have given me these many points and don't i i don't get that feeling in my mind i just try to i am in the way i was very good in this season to separate fpl points from my enjoyment of watching a match and in this way i was able to enjoy fantasy i was able to make decisions at the start of the game from a fantasy perspective how it might be uh, from my mind and 
the end result obviously it's out of my control Spot. so how it went I, i didn't let my feelings of that week or even the next transfer have influence on the previous result yeah if you can control that and accept it's exactly what i said last week if if you can if if the the decision you've made you know at that point is the right decision you can't you can't affect the outcome it might prove to be the wrong decision but if everything at that point when you make your decision in your mind is right you can't affect what happens next and right. last year was just so ridiculously unpredictable with i mean chelsea west brom is i think it's the one that most sky players will remember for the majority of the the season but there were plenty of mad scores throughout last season. Was there a particular highlight for you, Tala, from the season? I guess it's Sun's four goals, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, Sun's four goals. Uh, obviously, like more captain halls, obviously the better. But I guess uh, some of them, or ironically, most of them were defenders. Uh, the defender halls, which I would say, like kind of the differentials where Rob Holding got me 220 pointers and the two single game days when some people went for Lacazette or Saka then Westergaard having his uh, purple patch uh, before his injury uh, in the middle of the season where uh, others went for Saints midfielders or forwards Cancelo his 50 pointer Stones his 29 pointer I bought him just on that day before oh, his wow. that double goal although I didn't captain him I captained Diaz I think he got a goal also on that day he but did. anyhow I, I, he got an assist, I think, didn't he, Ruben Diaz? But yeah, that was all of us that night, wasn't it? Captain yeah. Diaz and uh, <laughs> but all had stones as well, I think, the majority of us. Mm. And you didn't do too badly at Stuart Dallas either. You had him for a while. Stuart um, Dallas. Yeah, I had him till the uh, overall, the second overhaul throughout. And after that overall, I moved to Rafinha or uh, Bamford wherever possible. I think the key for me moving from Dallas was that I noted that as the season went on, he moved more towards midfield. And with Elioski left back, Dallas lost his passing bonus or tackle uh, bonus element, which then uh, obviously I didn't want to spend a transfer of taking him out of a 6.4, but I saw that he lost his edge of the consistency of points. Hence, mm -hmm. post overall, I never got him back. That's why you finished 11th in the world, Tyler, because a lot of people will be like, oh, I've got a defender playing as a midfielder. Fill my boots, goals and assists out of position. That's But the FPL. We, we both wish we'd kept him, I bet. <laughs> But it's the FPL mindset and think is out of position, more attacking returns. And the sky mindset is, hang on a second, passing bonus and tackle bonus are gone. That makes him less valuable And yeah, I, I'm, I'll never see stuff like, well, I will maybe one day in the future in 10 years, but I, I would, wouldn't think like that, which is why I didn't finish very well. <laughs> Yank Vestergaard has got a lot to apologise for, for a lot of people. I think I've heard it described on, on the hub as best player of the season and worst player of the season, because I think there was a period before Christmas I didn't have him, but he was absolutely blinded. And there was a period after overall. I did have him. It's fucking useless. So <laughs> definitely wish I'd had Dallas. But no, that, that's right. I think a lot of us had that feeling with Dallas that it wasn't common that he picked up Parson tiers, but there were certain games where he was capable. And the tackle tiers were regular for him. Okay, he's now playing further forward. That's probably going to disappear a bit. What I don't think we'd factored in was what he could do in in front of goal. We couldn't foresee. What did he end up? Eight, nine goals for the season or something? Mm. I mean, 6.4 million defenders, ridiculous. It's arguably Sky player of the season on reflection. And many of us spent a long time without him. Is that, is that one of your biggest regrets then, Tala? Going without Dallas for that period? I think it's possibly mine. I think so. Because post overall, as I was saying, you know, I was keen in the position I was. I, I did uh, when I was structuring my squad and my transfers. I did always have in the back of my mind, I will have to have two to three at least differentials uh, from the rest because if the squads are exactly the same, I can no longer peak further. So I did always have that. And in my mind, initially I had that Dallas, not having Dallas might be the differential, but I guess uh, in hindsight now looking back, having Dallas might have been the differential when a lot of people went for Rafinha and I just because I didn't want to waste a transfer of Rafinha, I just stuck with him, where in um, probably Dallas was easily outscoring him even then. 
Yeah, that, that's the other thing with Dallas is Rafinha and Bamford, incredible prices. They're not going to be those prices next season. So offered great alternatives. So I think Leeds, are, I want to say the Wolves game away on the Friday and then Southampton at home on the Tuesday was not long after overhaul. I had Bamford. He had tons of chances at Wolves, including one goal disallowed for a fraction. He's, he's the king of that, Patrick Bamford. So missed it, but we all missed the Wolves game. And then he scored the opening goal against Southampton. You think, oh, I'm great, I'm in here. And then Dallas went went off, didn't he? <laughs> and killed everyone. I think Dallas was a 17 pointer that night or so. And it just felt it felt like everybody had Stuart Dallas that night. I, re- I remember that one. So my captain had returned, he got me 20 points or so and nosedived. Yeah. Yeah. Difficult. Tala. Absolute pleasure. Really, really enjoyed that. Are you going to win the money next year? I'll definitely try my best. And even as I was saying, you know, with the fixtures announcements kind of coming to normal, I believe there will definitely be some other elements of uh, cutting edge, not only on fixtures, but definitely on strategy, which I guess I can prosper on. Indeed. And uh, yeah, uh, I'm going to be trying to pick up a few tips here as well and, and see if I can start planning eight to 10 weeks out. Maybe James won't have to send me a reminder every match day. I ain't reminding every, you uh, every time next year. Uh, so. I, don't think, I don't think you should. I think I should uh, take my punches in the face. Uh, when, when <laughs> <laughs> I should just, just, just deal with it. Um, Sounds like yeah. you're going for an employment tribunal to me, mate. <laughs> <laughs> um, Quick question for you, Tyler, because I know it's changed for for James um, and to a certain degree for me as well. Um, so FPL or Sky now? Sky, definitely. And I, uh-huh. I would again say, obviously, from my answer, it might look people see that in FPL, I finished about 100K or 150K and in F Sky, I finished 11th. So I'm kind of biased. But even uh, I, I've been in a couple of group chats of the Sky with... Uh, Rob Pick and Corf, FPL Corf, they started a beginner's chat. I've been there. And from the start, I have been saying that how the Sky game is structured. I, I leave out how the admin part and the points are updated there, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> how the Sky game is structured. And uh, in general, I definitely prefer this. Mm, and even, even if the prize money wasn't there, like obviously it's easy to say, but I would say even if it was not there, it just looks a more fun game compared to FPL. Mm, especially for the people that are involved. Um, and, and get into the strategy and the weeds yeah. of it. So, yeah, fascinating. Thank you so much for joining us. Congratulations again. I mean, finishing 11th in your first season, absolutely Master. incredible. Uh, winning the league that you wanted to win so much, the Planet FPL Sky League as well, uh, was, was really good as well. So, yeah, appreciate you coming on, sharing your ideas, thoughts, um, and good luck for next season as well, my friend. Yeah, yeah, just do West man. <laughs> Uh, Thank you, James, George. no worries. Uh, James, you want to tell everybody what else they have to look forward to the rest of this week? I shall. I'll be streaming on YouTube tomorrow and then on Friday we'll be wrapping up season four of our FPL content with the big fat FPL quiz of 2020. 21. That's not the end of our season because we begin our Euros coverage uh, next Monday. That'll be going on through the summer. We've got lots planned during June, July, into August and the new season. Of which, Serge, it probably means fitting in Sky podcasts in July might be quite difficult. I'm just saying, nudge, nudge, they're probably going to be on Patreon, to tell you the truth, in July. And if you want to join us on Patreon this month, you can, and July will be free if you do so. This does bring the end to our Sky Season 2 coverage. Love to thank the Hub Boys, Joe and Luke on Scout, anybody who's provided content, Man on FPL, Season Keepers, all the patrons who've supported us, the Sky community have supported us with what we're doing. Frank with the website. Anyone else I've forgotten? That was the problem with starting that speech, wasn't it? (laughs) ffstuff.co.uk is the website for people that don't know what the web Frank's website is. Frank's website, yeah, (laughs) ffstuff.co.uk. Yeah, there's, there's, there's so many good tools out there, that being one, especially with the season reviews and so on. So, um, yeah, it's been a really good season of growth, I think, James, for the Sky FF community. And next season is only going to get and better. And we'll continue to grow and the game will get hard, harder. Um, in terms of our season two, this is the end of Sky Fantasy Football. But if you want to join us next Wednesday, 
Paul McNulty from Hub will be with us and we'll be discussing Scotland with him ahead of the European Championship. And we can ask Paul how he's going to spend Andrew Ferguson's winning (laughs) £75,000. Fergie, absolutely love you, mate. Many congratulations. Well done. Fergie's coming for drinks with us on July 24th. And apparently we've now got the bar free because I understand Fergie's paying for it. He's bought the bar, mate. What are you talking about? <laughs> he, he, doesn't know, he doesn't actually know that as yet, but I've just fi- I just yeah. figured he's got the money spare. <laughs> That's it. There's a great chance to, to shout that out. Anybody that's still listening that hasn't heard about the FPL, well, just fantasy football meetup on the 24th of July in London at the Editor's Tap um, with us, the guys from the surgery, guys from Who Got the Assist, just a free meetup to come down and talk and geek out on fantasy football over a drink or a snack or whatever takes your fancy. Good summary there, James. That's Cheers, been a lot. Stay safe, everybody. Chat for now. Thanks, Tala. Cue music, please, Madchild.